talk to you about being dangerous. Uh, don't you love the word dangerous? It is uh, defined, it's an adjective, and it means hazardous or troubling. Now, let me tell you the antonym. You remember from high school English, the antonym is the opposite of. The antonym for dangerous is careful, guarded, safe, secure, unhazardous, and untroubling. <laughs> I want to take, talk to you today about, about what it's like to be dangerous. If you are a Christian in the room today, I want you to know you are to be assured that heaven knows who you are. You are known in heaven. In fact, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The question I have for you today, are you known in hell? Uh, so I want you just to consider, are you known in hell? So I want to take you in the Bible back to Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul uh, spent some time in Ephesus. Turn there with me if you would, please. Acts chapter 19, we'll begin in verse 8. I'll give you a moment to get there. So the question I have for you today is, are you known in hell? And if you are known in hell, is hell afraid of you? (laughs) Are you dangerous? We've been talking about our theme, preaching theme for the years, higher, higher and dangerous, higher and danger today. So that's where I'm going to take you. Acts chapter 19, we're getting verse 8. And Paul entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were became hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the house of Tyrannius. This took place for two years, so that all that lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So you see what's happening. He's now, he spends three months in Ephesus. He's in the school of Tyrannius. It's a large hall. People are coming to him. The word of God is going forth and extraordinary miracles are taking place. Verse 12, so that handkerchiefs and aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. (laughs) So yeah, they're Jewish exorcists going from town to town, getting paid money for casting out demons, supposedly. So this is what happens. This is like third party spirituality. Right, that's what these, these guys, third party spirituality. Okay, so we're going to use the name that Paul uses and try to cast demons out. So that's the picture, the setting of the picture. Seven sons, one of Sceva, where Jewish chief priests were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know all about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on him and subdued all of them and overpowered them so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all who had the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. So you have the picture now? These seven sons of the chief priest named Sceva said, hey, We've been doing this from town to town, but we've never really tried this. Let's try a new approach. Let's use the name of Jesus. So the evil spirit is there, and the man who's demon-possessed jumps on the seven boys and beats them up, and they're wounded, and they're bleeding, and they're they're naked, and they're running. (laughs) So the question is, and here's the question the demon asks, who are you? Ah, that's a great question. That's a question I ask you today. Who are you? Who are we? What made Paul dangerous? I'd like to take a look at three different approaches this morning. Number one, I'd like to take a look at what made Paul so dangerous. Number two, I'd like to kind of define, overly, overall define what makes a dangerous Christian. And then I'll close by asking you some very specific questions. 
All right, so what is it that made Paul so dangerous? You know, Paul was just like any other guy, right? He was finally educated by the chief uh, rabbi Gamaliel. He has this wonderful experience with Christ. He's knocked down off of his horse. God speaks to him directly. And this man goes from a man who persecutes Christians, who's killing Christians. His whole life is transformed and turned around. And he becomes something very, very dangerous to hell. Now, I challenge you to look back in the annals of Christian history and remember some people that were dangerous to hell. Who, who do you think, give me some names, who do you think might have been dangerous to hell in the last 2,000 years in the church? Give me some names. Spurgeon. Who? Spurgeon. Spurgeon. <laughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the prince of preachers of the 1850s and 60s and 70s in England. Who else? <laughs> hmm? Tony, <laughs> Tony Evans, very dangerous man. He hell doesn't want to be around Tony Evans. John Huss, right? Went to his death, not accepting uh, anything other than Jesus himself. Smith Wigglesworth. You know, you had to bring up my favorite guy, right? Smith Wigglesworth. The hell must have been really deeply afraid of Smith. Smith walks around. He just walks in a room, man, and demons run and flee because the power vested in him, the spirit of God vested in him. Who else? Who? You, Michelle. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to do that. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle Randall. Say, so that in the room today, there are people who have this great potential to be dangerous to hell. And that's what I want you to be. Now, so number one, Paul had no personal ambition except to please God. The Bible says uh, in 1 uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal, our ambition is to please him. Can I ask you today, is that your ambition in life? You know, when, every, when little children grow up, they have ambitions, right? Little boys want to be NBA players. Little girls want to be doctors, lawyers, whatever. We all have these great things when you're little. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a fireman. <laughs> It must have been the trucks, man. It must have been the truck that turned me on. Yeah, I love the big red trucks. I said, yeah, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman. And then I realized I got, when I got older that firemen see some terrible things, you know, and I, I am real queasy when it comes to those kinds of things. So I realized pretty early on I had a, had a mid-course correction in far as a career is concerned. <laughs> so my question to you is, that what is your ambition? Paul had one ambition, and that was to please God. I wonder what would happen to the church of Christ if every one of us said, my ambition today is to be pleasing to my Father in heaven. How would that change our decisions? How would that change what we did? How would that change our conversation? How would that change how we spend our money? How would it change how we raise our children? How would it change how we drive? How would it change how we do everything in life if our one ambition was simply to please God? I always say I only have to please two people in the world. That's it. God and my wife. <laughs> and if you're married in the room, you better be aware that you need to make your, you know, please your spouse somewhere along the line. But really, it's, a, it's really what you have to do. Is you have to please God in life. Secondly, he got a taste of heaven and it ruined him for life. All right, so listen to this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, I was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't even know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up in the paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That'll mess you up. If you're taken to the third heaven and you see things that you can't tell and hear things you can't speak, that'll mess you up for good, man. Well, you are no longer a good sinner. That's what happens to Christians, by the way. Christians get saved, come into the kingdom of God, and then sometimes, every now and then, hardly ever happens, but every now and then, they'll backslide. Now, they'll leave the church for a while, they'll backslide a little bit, and then they are never happy sinners ever again. <laughs> They go dope it up, drink it up, whatever they want to do, but they never can be fully engaged and happy in their sin anymore because once you've tasted the good things of God, nothing else quite measures up. 
So the Apostle Paul is in heaven. Who knows what he saw? I don't know. Has engaged in this conversation with God in heaven. And now he comes back to earth. And here's what he knows. The day will come when my breath will stop, my heart will stop, and I'll get to go back to where I was in heaven with Jesus. My guess is that probably nobody in the room has died and gone to heaven just yet. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I don't know your story fully, but, but you know what that's like? Every now and then you find people that die and they go to heaven and they come back. And once you taste that, you're no good for earth anymore. You just keep longing to be with him. I think that's the way it was with the Apostle Paul. He so fell in love with what he saw in heaven that on nothing off the earth meant anything anymore except pleasing the Father. Why else was Paul dangerous to hell? Because he was humble, the least of the saints, the Bible says. He says it this way, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Something about humility, is it there? When you walk in humility, and we don't walk in pride and arrogance, we just simply know it's, Jesus, it's all about Jesus and not about us. <laughs> How much more we can accomplish in God's earth if we just simply know it's not about me, all right? There's no pride here. It's all about what Jesus can do through me. The reason Paul was so dangerous to hell and demons trembled when he walked by is because he was a humble man. Humility was all around him. I, I love that passage in uh, Philippians chapter 3, I think it is. He says, if I wanted to brag, I could. I'm not going to brag, but if I wanted to brag, I could. I could tell you that I was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised in the eighth day. I was, I, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I spoke Hebrew fluently. He goes, oh, this long list of accomplishments. If he wanted to bring them up, he could. If he wanted to brag about them, he could, but he's not going to. <laughs> but just so you know, it's out there. Another place he says that he would uh, boast of nothing except Christ and him crucified in his life. So I want you to know, people, man, you could take the best of the best of the best, the greatest human being on the earth, and the best thing they have going for them is Christ. It's Christ in us is the hope of glory. So it's a humility that made Paul so dangerous, I believe, to the gates of hell. He suffered the loss of all things, therefore he had nothing to lose. Listen to this passage in Philippians chapter 3. But whoever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all but rubbish that I may gain Christ. <laughs> all those worldly accomplishments count them as nothing because one thing mattered one thing alone mattered and that's his relationship with God and his call and mission to the earth I don't know what it must have been like to walk into a room and Paul Paul was there I think that you know what that's like when certain people have charisma there's a certain amount of charisma when people walk in the room they said this about President Obama that every time he stood in a podium to speak somewhere the instant charisma was in the place and every eye was on him it's not just about human charisma. It's not just about, you know, a good-looking, fine, fine uh, 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 orator. It's about this. It's about you as the real deal, the real carrier of the Holy Spirit. You're the repository of the Holy Spirit of God. He chooses to dwell in you. He chooses to dwell in us, collectively in us, and individually in you. So when you walk in the room someplace, the Holy Spirit walks in the room. And when that happens, man, anything can happen. Miracles can take place. People's lives can be transformed simply because you walk in the room. And it has nothing to do with you. It's what, it's what you're carrying in your spirit person on the inside, and that's God himself. I think back to the Apostle Paul. Just, he's walking in, um, it was in Ephesus. He was walking in Ephesus, and, Ephesus, and these demon possessed people come running up to him and falling down at his feet. What caused that? Charles Finney, one of those great revivalists in the 1800s, Charles Finney would walk into a, into a, in a room and people would just begin to fall down and be repent immediately. 
He pulls into the train station in Hempstead, New York, and nobody knows he's on the train. Nobody knows he's on the train. The train pulls in, and the entire platform, everybody begins to fall on their faces and repent of their sin. He, Finney walks out, sees this what's happening, and just begins to bring people to Christ just like that. What was it about a guy like Finney? What was it about a man that carried that kind of a strong anointing? I want you to know there's nothing different between Charles Finney and you other than your names are spelled different. You have the same potential. Every human being has the same potential. I love it. I'm not talking about IQ. You know, IQ, we all differ from person to person with IQ. You've met those smart people, right? Those really smart people. They're just like too smart to be around. They're so smart. I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm talking about not intelligent quotient, but spirit quotient. So my challenge to you is going to be this. I'm going to challenge you today to be dangerous to hell by being available to and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. When I say available to, available to, that means that you are, uh, ex- he, has, he has access to you. You know what that's like? Where sometimes we're doing our own thing. We're too busy for God. I'm, ge- I'm getting over something over here. I'm getting more money over here. I'm do- accomplishing this over here for myself. And the Lord's saying, I'm looking for somebody on the earth to accomplish the work. Who is available? Isaiah chapter 6 sees the Lord high and lifted up, and, and he says, who will go, the, the Spirit of God says, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, hear my Lord, send me. I think what God is looking for today on the earth is more people that will raise their hand and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Let me be the dangerous guy. Let me be the dangerous woman to hell, that hell would run when I walk in the door. And I want you to know that's some, not some spiritual fairy tale somewhere. That is possible for everyone in the room. And all we have to do is be available to the power of God, and we have to decrease while he increases. Have you ever prayed that? When I was first saved, I read that passage in John chapter 3. It says, uh, John the Baptist says, that you may increase that I may decrease. And I loved that verse. I thought, oh yeah, that's for me, man. That's my verse. It didn't take me long to understand. In order for him to increase, I had to decrease. And that's the hard part of the equation. If a vessel is three quarters full, you can only put a quarter in it until it's full. Unless you empty out what's in it. As you and I empty out of ourselves, then we are filled up with his power. Listen, if I have a choice any day, man, I would much rather have his power running through me than all the, all the power I can muster up. Because I can muster some up, you know, by hook or by crock. I can get some up there. But nothing like when he's fully engaged in my spirit, man. And then I'm speaking on his behalf. And his words are speaking through me. And his actions are working through me. And I see the sick man in, in the mall somewhere. And I say, can I pray for you? And I lay hands upon the sick. And they recover. And that's good Bible. Can you imagine having a, a, a demon convention in Ephesus somewhere? And Paul walks in the door and the the whole party's over. I wonder what happens when you and I walk through the door when the demon party's going on. Is the party over? Now, this is an interesting one. Uh, Paul had no rights to fight for. He was a bondservant. Now, listen to the opening words of uh, the book of Philippians. And now, these opening words are used in many of Paul's different writings. He says this. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Now, when you and I read that phraseology in 21st century America, it doesn't mean a lot to us. Bondservants today is just just another word. A bondservant in the first century was someone with no rights whatsoever. He was owned by somebody. He had no rights whatsoever. He even took on his master's name. I, I ask you today, have, have you taken on your master's name? <laughs> you know, every now and then we want to fight for our rights. I want, I have rights. Don't, you know, I have rights. I grew up in the 60s. We talked about rights all the time. It was the civil rights movement. And I grew up in the, the Vietnam era. Hell no, we won't go. I was part of the whole deal, man. We're all fighting for rights. I want you to know something. When I found Jesus, I realized I don't have any rights at all. The only rights I have is to be a son and sit upon his lap and 
take orders from the Most High God who desires nothing but good upon the face of the earth. And as far as I am concerned, I want to just simply be there. I just want to be a son sitting in the Father's lap taking orders. Yes, Lord, I will go there. Yes, Lord, I will pray for that person. Yes, Lord, I will sing that song in public. <laughs> I had a friend one time, she went inside of an elevator and uh, there's a, just her and this man in the elevator. You know what that elevator's like, right? You know the uncomfortable feeling the elevator? People, here's what people do in all of the elevators. They don't want to engage each other, so they, they look up at the numbers. <laughs> right. Or today, now we have phones, so now we get our phones, we look at our phones. What is that weirdness, man, about an elevator? You don't want to engage the eyes of the other person. So she walked to the elevator, and she really felt the Lord say, look into his eyes and sing, Jesus loves me. <laughs> you want to get tested on your spirituality? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so she's in the elevator, and she, and she knows the voice of the Lord. She knows God's calling her to do this. She, she, you know, she's wrestling. You know, how many floors got to go up? I don't know how many floors there were, but you know, it better be <laughs> a lot more than five or six floors if you've got to wrestle with God about something. So finally she said, okay, I'm going to do this. And she said, I looked into his eyes, and I sang... Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. And he just began to cry. He just began to cry. There was no further conversation. He was crying. <laughs> Door opened up, it was his floor, and he walked away. Do you know I think no one's going to know the full impact of that story until heaven? I think there are a lot of stories that we don't know the end to. We know the beginning. We know the part of the story that we were a part of, but we don't know the end of it. You don't know when you're fully engaged with God and fully obedient to him and you do something that affects another person's life, what that really did for them. So let's all be safe and just be obedient when we hear the, the voice of the Lord speaking to us. A bond servant, he had no, no rights, no anything. Just, he just served his master. That's what we're called to do. All right. Another reason Paul was dangerous to hell is because he died every day. Therefore, he had no fear of death. Uh, listen to this. 1 Corinthians 15, 31 says... I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. <laughs> yeah, that's dying on the installment plan, right? Yeah, I die every day. If you're dying every day, then death has no real hold over you. You know what I find? I find a lot of people are afraid to die. Have you noticed that? Maybe some of you are there. How many of you want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. How many were you going to, go to want to go today? Okay, fewer of you. <laughs> fewer of you want to go today. <laughs> so years and years ago, I found something in uh, a quote by Spurgeon that's in my Bible. And every time I get a new Bible, I put it right here in the front part of my Bible. I want you to listen to this, all right? We shall not die until the time which he appoints for our death time, like all of our time is in his hands. Our skirts may brush up against the portals of the sepulcher, and yet we shall not pass the iron gate unharmed if the Lord be our guard. The wolves of disease will hunt us in vain until God shall permit them to overtake us. The most desperate enemies may waylay us, but no bullet shall find its billet in our heart unless the Lord allows it. Our life does not even depend upon the care of angels, nor can our death be compassed by the malice of devils. We are immortal to our work is done. Let me repeat that. We are immortal to our work is done. Immortal till the immortal king shall call us home to the land where we shall be immortal in a still higher sense. <laughs> so why are we afraid of death, man? Listen, he, Paul is not afraid to die. 
When you live a life that is consumed with Jesus, you're not afraid to die. You know why? Because death just becomes your promotion. It's like your graduation day from this earth, from these three dimensions into eternity, into forever with him. You're no longer bound by earthly things, no longer bound by weaknesses, no longer bound by sicknesses, but you are with him in perfection forever. I don't know about you, but I want to go there and do that. Years ago, there was a, a movie whose name I forget now, but it was about a knight, right? A knight, and it was, he was fearless. He was feared by everybody around of all the other knights because uh, he, when he would joust, he was fearless. He knew no fear whatsoever. Well, as the story unfolds, you find out that he had lost his love, and life didn't mean anything to him anymore, so therefore he had no, life meant nothing, so he wasn't afraid to risk his life all the time. That's not us. It's not us at all. Because we have found our love. We have found our love, and his name is Jesus. And therefore, we know that he has all of our days in his hands. And you can't be afraid to die, because when you do, you get to be with him. All right. Now, this is an interesting text. He was a fool for Christ and considered himself to be the scum of the earth. That weird phraseology. Recently, I ran across some churches, looking at names of odd names for churches. There's a church in Colorado called the Scum of the Earth. <laughs> now I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to put that name in the front of my church. You know, the Scum of the Earth Church on Chestnut Street. I don't, I don't know that that's a good name or not, but <laughs> but the church was about. Going to the lowest low and to the meanest mean and to the broken, the most broken of the broken. And they went to the most broken of the broken and they found them and they brought them to Christ. Recently, I saw a video of a girl whose name I forget. Um, but she uh, she's, has tattoos all over her body. She's a preacher. And so tattoos all over her body. You know, she's this real hip girl. She has all this with wild hair going on. And she just ministers to street people. That's all she does all day long. Ministers to street people. Goes into the broken places where nobody else will go. Into the hopeless places where nobody else will go. And she finds the broken. And she brings them to Jesus. And that's her church. That is our mission, by the way. If you're looking for a mission, you just found one. Go to the broken where nobody else will go. Everybody, everybody wants to take the gospel to the, you know, to the millionaires. <laughs> Anyhow, this is what the Bible says. For I think, where am I at here? For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, for you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are, we, you are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we must both be hungry and thirsty, and we are poorly clothed, and we are roughly treated, and we are homeless, and we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to re- reconcile, uh, conciliate. We become as scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even unto now. <laughs> when you consider yourself in that place, man, you are dangerous to hell. If you have never read a small book called The Screw Tape Letters, I would, I would urge you to do so. Okay. The Screw Tape Letters is a small book by C.S. Lewis, and it's, it's um, Screw Tape is like the nephew of Satan himself, and S- Satan is writing, like a chief demon is writing to his nephew and a bunch of small demons, telling them how to best uh, trick human beings. It is a worthwhile read. You really find out well, how sensitive we are to the things of the enemy and to the things of darkness, how easily we get tricked up by them. All right, part two, almost done. A few general suggestions of what makes a Christian really totally dangerous. Number one, um, hell knows they are its enemy because of how they live, their values, and their behaviors. 
Hell knows who you are and who you represent because of your life, your values, and your behaviors. How you live. When hell watches how you live, (laughs) things begin to happen. They become afraid. It becomes afraid of you because you're living too different from the rest of the world. When they look at your core values, by the way, each of you should have core values, how you live your life. And they look at your behaviors. Our values, our, our behaviors are simply an outgrowth of living out our values. All right? Number two, they live in the reality of the cross and they fix their eyes on heaven. They live a crucified life. I, I love the cross. When I was saved and I was 17 years old, someone said, uh, it's about the cross. And it wasn't long until somewhere, you know, I'm a book collector. I, I collect thousands of books. It's my passion. It, wasn't, it was just a very short time until I found a small book by A.B. Simpson called the, Christ, the Crucified Life. Like, ah, yeah, that's me, man. Me and the cross. I want to be crucified. Jesus had his cross. I have mine. And therefore, I can have my eyes fixed on heaven while having the crucified life here. Next, they are passionate for God and his truth. Let me tell you that you must be passionate about Christ. Not laissez-faire. Not, yeah, I'm really passionate about motorcycles, <laughs> which I am. But, but, you know, and Jesus on the same level. I do hope there are motorcycles in heaven. But if there's not, I'm okay with that. As long as there's Jesus in heaven. Don't ever, ever let someone try to push your zeal down. It's time for the church to be zealous for our Jesus. Don't let people say, oh, no, don't get fanatical now. When I was a young man in Christ, I was, you know, I was crazy, man. I was crazy. You know? And people would say to me, now, 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 the older, the more mature you get, the more you calm down, you calm down. And I said to them, God forbid. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Don't you ever, I'm going to calm down. Now, I believe we ought to be passionate. We ought to be crazy, head over heels in love with Christ all the days of our life. And then when you're in love with somebody, you, get it, you talk about them all the time. So don't let anybody ever squelch your zeal or your passion for Christ. It makes you dangerous. Finally, they are missional. They know they have a mission. And they live their life every day to walk out that mission. What is your mission, church? Your mission is to be incarnational. That is to be incarnational, is to be Christ alive on the earth. See, Jesus went to heaven. He says, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm leaving something on the earth. I'm leaving this whole little group of people down here. There's these 12 disciples, that little group of people. And I'm going to put my spirit in them, and they're going to propagate the gospel of Christ all over the world. How crazy is that? 12 guys. Well, by the, it was really 11 by that time, right? Judas had blown the coop by then. He was gone. 11 guys. Then before you know it, these 11 guys start hanging out and talking about Jesus. And then there's 120. So they multiplied themselves 10 times. And then the 120 got together one day. By the way, who knows today is Pentecost Sunday. On the church calendar, today is Pentecost Sunday, right? So on Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, they got together 120 in the same room, being of the same mind with one another, loving Jesus together, and the Spirit of God comes, and Peter stands up and preaches the sermon, and 5,000 people come to Christ at one time. You think Jesus knew what he was doing when he left the Spirit of God in the life of 12 guys, 11 guys? Yeah. Okay. Questions for you to consider, then I'm done. Are you sold out to the kingdom of God? You don't have to answer out loud. (laughs) Are you sold out to the kingdom of God? Well, you know, sold out means 100%. I'm I'm all in. I'm all in this thing called called the kingdom of God. Now, sometimes we try to maintain a border position. You know what that's like? I want to be in, but I want to be real close to the line in case I want to step out. I want to be close enough to the line in case I just want to take a weekend and step out. I can go do my thing, you know. 
Here's what the kingdom is about. Stepping in across the line and keep on going. And you go, and you go, and you go, and you know when you're done. You will know you're where you're done when you look just like Christ and sound just like Christ and think just like Christ and behave just like Christ. And that's when you know you're done. Are you there yet? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) So, no longer maintaining a border position, but you're all in all the way. Number two. Are you dying to yourself and the things of the world? That's self-explanatory. Number three, are you passive or are you bold for God? I used to um, have a friend who used to practice his salvation speech on his dog. Because he wasn't real, you know, he wasn't real bold, so he, he, would, he had a dog, so he kept preaching to the dog. <laughs> And I don't know if the dog ever got saved or not, but, but, but he got better at preaching the gospel. I know that. Wow, that reminds me of a story. So Mahesh Shavda, right? Mahesh Shavda is a, a, a guy, that, a preacher. Um, Mahesh Shavda was in Africa. He was someplace, I think Africa. And he was walking along and he sees a bunch of baboons on, on the like a, like a hill. And Mahesh, Mahesh is a crazy spiritual guy. Mahesh is just one of those way out there guys. <clears throat> and Mahesh said, I heard the Lord say to me, preach the gospel to the baboons. <laughs> and he says, I know, I know the voice of God. I know, I know what God, it was God's voice. And, and Lord asked, he says, Lord, I, I know you just didn't say that to me. And the Lord repeated, he says, preach the gospel to the baboons. So he said, all I know to do was just be obedient. So he said, there was, a, there was a, like a stump. I, said, I stood up on the stump and I preached the gospel of Jesus to the baboons. He said, I got down off the tree stump and I, well, what do you do, right? You look around and make sure there's nobody watching you. That's what you do, you know. <laughs> and, and the Lord said, you forgot to, to give them an altar call. <laughs> so he gets back up on the stump and he gives the altar call. If you want to come to know Jesus, come on down here. I'll pray for you. (laughs) What Mahesh didn't know is that on the other side of the hill, there are about 12 women who heard the gospel story and came walking over the hill and he prayed for all 12 women that day to accept Christ. So the next time you hear the Lord calling you to preach to the dogs or to the squirrels, <laughs> go ahead, I dare you. All right. Are you walking in faith or just in the area that you see? Now, the, the whole faith thing is that it's the area that we cannot see. I can believe for this piece of furniture. I can believe for this Bible. I can believe for this iPad. It's right here in front of me. It's the place where I'm challenged by God to believe for something that I cannot yet see. That's faith. And if you're not in a place right now, you're praying for stuff you can't see, man, you need to jump into it now. We need to jump into a place of faith where we're going to pray for big things because we serve a big God. What would we pray for little things when we serve a big God? If God said, I'm giving you this avenue with this thing called prayer, and you could pray for anything you want, why would you pray for a cheeseburger when you could pray for a steak? Why would you pray for a moped when you can have the full dressed motorcycle? You need to step into places and begin to pray by faith for things and stop accepting things for the way they are. Look around your community. And I challenge you to find something that's wrong with your community. You don't have to look far, trust me. Find a thing that's wrong with your community and begin to pray against that thing and for the power of God to be vested right there in that place. All right, almost done. Are you tame or are you living in the holy wild? And Dillard says, how you spend your days is, of course, how you spend your life. Are you tame or are you living in the holy wild? 
My challenge to you today is to step out of the tame life and begin to be a threat to hell and a threat to the powers of darkness. All the light has to do in the darkness is just show up. Hey man, if you just show up and your light, the darkness is dispelled because of your presence. Let's pray together. Father, as we consider that beautiful text in Acts chapter 19, when we consider that Paul was indeed a threat to hell, Lord, I would ask today, Lord, that we would be in that crowd. We will be in that group of people that hell's afraid of. Lord, I pray that you would take us higher in being dangerous. That the love of God would so control us, so constrain us, that every day of our life we live because of our life, our values, and our behavior, we become known in the gates of hell as men and women that make a difference, men and women that are a threat to the powers of darkness. Lord, here we are, send us. Here we are, change us. Here we are, utilize our giftings upon the face of the earth to see the gospel message of Christ taken forth and we understand we are missional in in nature. We are called to go forth and to be, not just preach the good news, but be the good news. In Jesus' name, amen.